Butch to uh, host our afternoon session uh, for the third annual Drug Discovery and Development Summit. Um, we have three speakers this afternoon. They'll each have a, a half an hour and we will have uh, five minutes each uh, for question and answers. Uh, I'd like to remind everyone that we are doing questions and answers in the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen. Uh, unless you are part of the panel, then you don't have access to the Q&A screen. Uh, and just raise your hand with the raise hand function and we'll uh, have you come on and, and ask your questions there. Okay, let's get right to it. Uh, we have uh, three very nice presentations coming up. The first is from uh, Stefan uh, Naraki. He's an associate pr professor uh, uh, in medical oncology in the College of Medicine here at the University of Arizona. Uh, he's also part of the cancer biology uh, program. Uh, Stefan received his doctoral degree in biomedical sciences from uh, UT University of Texas, MD Anderson, uh, down there in Houston. I uh, did his postdoctoral work staying in the South with St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Um, he's been involved for some time in molecular mechanisms of action of novel experimental cancer therapeutics, um, helping to direct the medical oncology translation group here in Tucson. Um, we're going to hear some more, I suspect, about uh, proteostasis uh, this afternoon, uh, for which uh, Stefan has uh, a number of awards, including uh, awards from the International Myeloma Foundation, which we heard from this morning, uh, as well as Leukemia and Lymphoma Society uh, and the Volcker Foundation. So Stefan's uh, title for today is New Strategies to Overcome Resistance to histone deacetylase inhibitors, which actually was not what I was expecting, but I'm looking forward to it. So take her away, Stefan. Thank you very much, Bill. Let me just screen share here. Okay, so again, thank you very much, Bill, for that kind uh, introduction. And he is absolutely right. I am not going to talk about uh, endoplasmic reticular stress today, but uh, I'm gonna talk about some of the newer work we've been doing um, targeting uh, drug resistance to histone deacetylase inhibitors in models of T-cell lymphoma. And so non-Hodgkin's lymphomas uh, are the most common blood cancer, and they can be broken up into uh, B as well as T cell. And we will focus on uh, T cell lymphomas today. And patients with relapsed refractory uh, PTCL uh, or uh, CTCL uh, still tend to have a very poor prognosis. Uh, indeed, uh, over 75% of patients with PTCL that have refractory disease tend to relapse after two years. And for advanced uh, cutaneous T cell lymphoma, uh, it is also uh, fairly poor as well with a medium overall survival of less than five years. Uh, both of these tend to be fairly difficult to study as they um, are very rare diseases. Uh, however, though, incidence does appear to be increasing recently. And one of the main uh, stays of treatment are uh, HDAC inhibitors, and they uh, have provided significant benefit, but obviously uh, drug resistance uh, continues to be a pretty significant issue. So obviously uh, histones are core proteins of DNA and uh, acetylation of them is controlled by both uh, histone acetyltransferases, uh, as well as histone deacetylases or HDACs. Elevated HDAC activity has been seen in various tumor types, uh, in particular T-cell lymphoma. And of course, we know that increased HDAC activity uh, promotes tumor genesis through inhibition uh, of various uh, tumor suppressor genes, as well as other uh, important genes that are involved with cell cycle regulation. And so over the last uh, several years, uh, there have been a number of uh, HDAC inhibitors that are FDA approved. 
Uh, Romodepsin is a class one HDAC inhibitor. It was approved for CTCL as well as PTCL. Then uh, we have a series of pan HDAC inhibitors, uh, varinostat, bolinostat, and panabinostat. Uh, varinostat is approved. It's also known as, as Saha. Uh, it was approved uh, several years ago for CTCL and more recently bolinostat, which I'll focus on today, uh, was approved for PTCL. And then I'll just mention uh, panabinostat. Uh, has also been approved, but not for T cell lymphoma, lymphoma for multiple myeloma, and it's frequently given in combination with standard of care. As I've mentioned, uh, relapsed refractory disease continues to be a, a major problem, and uh, uh, the mechanisms that uh, to understand this uh, are not really well understood, and we think this is partially due to a lack of uh, key models of drug resistance. And we then hypothesized that uh, the process of acquiring drug resistance uh, may possibly yield specific vulnerabilities that we will be able to target. And so to confirm uh, that indeed uh, our T-cell lymphoma models are sensitive to alinostat treatment, uh, we tested a, a panel of four different T-cell lymphoma models to alinostat. And as you can see on the left slide, uh, Bolinostat significantly decreases the cell viability uh, of all four of these and also induces uh, apoptotic cell death, which we measured uh, in the right panel by uh, uh, PI staining and uh, fax analysis. So obviously a key deficiency in the field is there's not really a lot of drug resistant models to study this. And so uh, I'll show some of the representative data here where we generated uh, drug resistant models. This shows um, two of our lines, uh, HUT78 and HUT102. And so the parentals are just designated uh, as such. And then the bolinostat resistant models are designated with the R afterwards. And so these were generated uh, over a fairly significant period of time where we continuously treated these cells with uh, bolinostat. And as you can see, we have developed significant resistance over time uh, in both of these models. Okay, and so in addition to uh, the decrease in cell viability, I think I skipped one there, yes. Uh, so in addition to the decrease in cell viability, uh, of course, we also do not observe uh, an accumulation of acetylated histones. Uh, which is a common marker of uh, HDAC inhibitor therapy. So again, we have the parental cell shown here in the left, CARPUS-299 and HUT-78. And then as we treat with 0, 5, and even 10 micromolar bolinostat, you can observe that for many of these, we do not uh, observe any histone acetylation. And also consistent with that, we also observe a significant uh, inhibition of cell death following bolinostat treatment in both of these uh, drug-resistant models. Importantly, uh, we wanted to know whether or not cross-resistance would also occur to other FDA-approved uh, HDAC in inhibitors. And so we have romodepsin here on the left, varinostat in the center, and panobinostat on the right. And in each case, we observe some level of Cross resistance with our bolinostat resistant models, which are shown in the gold and in the orange uh, bars. And so this tells us that though we think that these models are in general pr pretty good for representing uh, drug resistance to HDAC inhibitors in general, and not something that's just specific to uh, bolinostat. Okay, so we next wanted to perform. Oh, we next wanted to perform transcriptome analysis. And so we did this in, in both the HUT-78 and the CARPUS-299 parental and drug-resistant models. And one of the things we noticed was that a lot of uh, antivirus-related genes uh, appeared to be significantly downregulated. And so specifically, uh, IRF1 and STAT1 in particular were uh, dramatically decreased in the uh, bolinostat resistant cells. 
So to confirm this, we uh, per performed a quantitative real-time PCR, which is shown in the two right panels. And indeed, the levels of STAT1 were uh, significantly decreased uh, in both of these models. And so as, as everyone here knows, uh, STAT1 plays a very important process in the uh, antiviral uh, interferon response pathway. And so since these cells appear to have a deficiency in that pathway, we then hypothesize that uh, these uh, HDAC inhibitor resistant cells may be preferentially sensitive to oncolytic viral therapy. And so for those of you who don't know, uh, oncolytic viruses have been evaluated as a cancer therapy for a, for a very long time. However, there was a breakthrough several years ago when the first uh, herpes uh, de de derived virus, TVAC, uh, was approved for melanoma. And so our, our lab is working on another virus called Dereal virus. Uh, it is a, a naturally occurring oncolytic double-stranded RNA virus. It is ubiquitous, meaning it's, it's found, found everywhere, commonly in rivers and streams. And this is a wild type virus. So we did not do any genetic uh, uh, manipulation to it. It is frequently found uh, or can be isolated from the respiratory and GI tract of, of, of most humans. However, it is non-pathogenic. And the reason why it's being used for cancer therapy initially was uh, previous work has shown that it's able to selectively replicate in cells that have a mutant RAS or specifically a RAS activated pathway. And there are three different serotypes of the real virus. However, um, therapeutically, uh, the Deering strain or the type three is the one I'll focus on since it has a very strong therapeutic index toward uh, targeting cancer cells while having uh, essentially the very limited effect on normal cells. So based on this observation that uh, the Deering strain can uh, specifically replicate in tumors, a biotech company was formed called Oncolytics Biotech Inc. And we worked with them for a number of years. They have developed their own proprietary formulation of the real virus called the real Lysin, which they now market as Pella Real Rep. And it's been evaluated over the years in uh, over 30 different clinical trials. Uh, many of these initial trials were focused on uh, commonly uh, RAS activated tumors such as pancreatic cancer. Uh, we were involved uh, uh, in those studies, uh, also in uh, head and neck cancer. And uh, more recently, the company has decided to focus on two different areas. One is breast cancer, where they're currently running a phase three trial in combination with Taxol and uh, anti pdl one uh, antibodies. And then also based on our work in MM, uh, there are two currently active trials, one uh, looking at the real license in combination with bortezomib and DEX, and then the follow-up study looking at uh, carfilzomib, dexam dexamethasone, and uh, anti-PD-1. And so despite all of these trials and all the work that's been done, uh, there really hasn't been any uh, investigation of the real license uh, in patients with uh, lymphoma. So since our uh, HDAC inhibitor resistant cells displayed a significant uh, diminishment of STAT1 and other antiviral genes, we wanted to, to see if indeed uh, the real virus could replicate much more in the resistant cells. And that is, in, that is exactly what we found. So by using electron microscopy, the resistant cells shown here in the bottom, you see there's significantly more real virus replication in the bolinistat resistant cells compared to the parental. And this is quantified in the panel on the right. And along with the increased uh, viral replication, we also observed enhanced uh, sensitivity to real lysin. So here we measured cell viability comparing parental and the resistant cells. And in each case, um, the resistant cells were significantly more sensitive to, to real lysin. Interestingly, we also performed a uh, combination study since real lysin tends to work best uh, not as a monotherapy, 
but in combination with standard of care. And so we combined real bison with uh, the bolinostat. As we showed before, uh, the bolinostat resistant cells are, of course, resistant to the agent. And real lysin is, is more uh, sensitive as a monotherapy in the resistant cells. But the combination of bolinostat and real lysin um, uh, seem to be very effective uh, in both the parental as well as the HDAC inhibitor resistant cells. We then evaluated this combination in vivo. And so here we have the parental tumors on the left panel. And we observe, a, again, a moderate uh, anti-tumor response with bolinostat and real license single agent therapy, but a benefit with the combination. Then on the right in the resistant tumors, uh, as we'd expect, bolinostat has essentially no effect uh, against these tumors. Real license pr produced a very potent uh, the uh, single agent uh, response, and this would this was even uh, enhanced a little bit better with the combination. And also for those of you who don't know a lot about the real lysin, it is very well tolerated uh, in the clinic. Uh, actually, in the early studies, they did not not even achieve a, a maximum tolerated dose. And so, as we'd expect in the combination studies here in the mice. Uh, we did not observe a significant animal weight loss or uh, any other signs of uh, toxicity with drug treatment. We then evaluated the tumors and we observed very similar effects to what we saw in vitro, where uh, again, the real virus seemed to replicate much more efficiently in the resistant cells. And even more so, uh, this was observed with the bolinostat plus the real lysin combination, and that is quantified in the panel on the right. And finally, we also observe a decrease in tumor cell proliferation, where we see significant decrease in PCNA and in and a correspondingly increase in cleave caspase three. So we inhibit strongly the proliferation of the tumors and also induce uh, apoptotic cell death, which is, which is again, the most pronounced with the uh, combination. So just to kind of summarize some of the initial part of my talk, um, we, we generated this model where we see bolinostat resistance causes this decrease in STAT1, which is a key antiviral protein. This causes a, a vulnerability to uh, uh, oncolytic viral therapy, leading to high levels of the real virus, and uh, also seems to combine very well with uh, bolinostat, both in parental and drug-resistant models. And for those of you who are interested, this work was published uh, just last year, uh, where there's uh, additional data. We wanted to then explore the relationship between uh, oncolytic viral therapy and STAT1, since STAT1 was one of the major markers that was decreased in our transcriptome analyses in the HDAC inhibitor resistant cells. And so indeed, when we knocked down STAT1, we observed much more real virus accumulation by electron microscopy shown on the left. And then we quantified this in the, in the right. So not only do we see more uh, virus accumulated per cell, but we also see increased uh, the real virus accumulation uh, in the number of cells as well. We expanded our analysis to additional uh, T cell lymphoma models, and um, uh, some of our models were uh, HTLV1 positive. And so uh, for those of you who may not know, uh, HTLV1 uh, is associated with T cell lymphoma, not so much in this, in this country, but in other countries throughout the world. And what we found was uh, in the T cell lymphoma models that are HDLV1 positive, that actually those cells tend to be more resistant to oncolytic real virus therapy. And this is due to elevated activation of JAK-STAT uh, pathways. So importantly though, uh, if we treat with the JAK inhibitor ruxolitinib, as we can see in the top right panel, uh, we are able to significantly sensitize both the parental as well as the resistant cells. 
And then in the bottom right panel, we uh, transfected the Carpus 299 um, HTLV1 negative cell line with, with, with HTLV1. And we see that indeed it causes resistance to real lysin, but when we treat with the JAK inhibitor, we are able to significantly restore sensitivity to real lysin. And this work was again recently published this year in uh, the, the viruses and the citation is there if you would like more information as I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Okay, so just to summarize uh, this initial work, uh, HDAC inhibitor resistant cells are hypersensitive to oncolytic viral therapy. And we believe this is due to a diminished uh, antiviral response, specifically STAT, STAT1. The real virus replicates more effectively in the HDAC inhibitor resistant models and also enhances the activity of bolinostat. We also observe that HDLV1 positive cells tend to be resistant to uh, real lysin. Uh, however, ag again, with the, with the JAK inhibitor, we were able to restore sensitivity. And so we are currently speaking with some of our clinical colleagues about uh, potentially two, two avenues to move this work into the clinic. And so we've identified real lysin and bolinostat as being a promising combination. Uh, uh, and then also real lysin plus a uh, JAK inhibitor. And so the, the first part of my talk was just kind of building up to what we've been doing more recently with the Arizona Center for uh, Drug Discovery. And so I talked a lot about STAT1, which as you can see on our transcriptome heat map on the left uh, is at the very bottom, since uh, that was one of the genes that was the most uh, down-regulated across our resistant cells. But now I'd like to talk about one of the genes that is actually the, uh, one of the most upregulated in the resistant cells, and it's a gene called PEG, PEG10. And so to confirm the uh, transcriptome analysis shown here on the left, we performed quantitative real-time PCR shown on the right. As you can see, the levels of HUT78 are extremely low in the parental cells, and we observe a, a dramatic uh, increase uh, at the transcript level. And this was also seen at the protein level in the bottom panel in the uh, immunoblotting experiment. So what is PEG10? And so it, it stands for paternally expressed gene 10, and it's actually a, a gene that's essential for placental development. And when we knock this gene out in mice, it results in lethality on day uh, 10.5. And so interestingly, uh, while PEG10 is needed for development, uh, it is uh, generally not needed in adult tissue and it's frequent, frequently absent or expressed uh, at very low amounts. Uh, this gene has been previously reported to regulate cell growth as well as cell death. There's also been studies showing that it can have oncogenic properties to increase cellular proliferation, migration, invasion, and also inhibit uh, apoptotic cell death. There's been a few studies showing that it's overexpressed in other uh, tumor types. Most of these are focused in uh, liver cancer, uh, hepatocellular carcinoma, and there's also a more recent study focused on bladder cancer. Uh, and in each case, uh, overexpression of PEG10 uh, is uh, associated with a, a very poor prognosis. And so we then thought that maybe PEG10, uh, at least in our T-cell lymphoma models, may potentially be a novel biomarker of HDAC inhibitor resistance and, uh, and maybe also a, a novel therapeutic target. And so, however, though, there are currently no specific small molecule inhibitors of PEG10. So we went back to uh, our resistant cells and we had actually made uh, freezebacks of these cells at various stages of drug resistance. And so here we measured PEG10 levels by quantitative real-time PCR when uh, they were at uh, a resistance level of three micromolar and also five micromolar in two different models, the HUT78 and the HUT102. And in each case, we saw a significant increase at three micromolar 
and then even a further increase at five. And we currently have cells that, ex that exhibit 10 micromolar drug resistance, and we plan to test them to see whether or not PEG-10 will be even higher. But this data um, uh, we thought was very positive, demonstrating that PEG-10 does seem to be playing a positive role in uh, balinostat resistance. So we decided to knock down PEG-10 in our HUT-78 resistant uh, cells. So as you can see in the immunoblot, the resistant cells have a, a significant amount of PEG-10. PEG uh, we used four different SHRNAs, uh, and we decided to choose uh, SHRNA uh, number two for the, the rest of our study since our knockdown was the best in that one, or at least similar to uh, three and four. And then when we measured cell growth over a period of 96 hours, when we knocked down PEG-10, we saw that it caused a significant decrease in cell growth compared to the parental cells. Conversely, we then wanted to see, well, can we observe this same effect if we overexpress PEG-10 in the HUD-78 parental cells? So again, these cells have essentially uh, uh, zero PEG-10, uh, and then we forcibly overexpress it. And as you can see, again, we measured cell growth. And in this case, the overexpressed PEG-10 cells uh, tend to grow much faster than our, our HUT-78 uh, GFP parental cells. And then the obvious question is next is, what will happen if we treat these cells with a, a bolinostat? So here, these are our HUD-78 resistant cells. Uh, as you, you can see, they have very high levels of resistance to bolinostat. We were able to achieve uh, some uh, restoration of sensitivity at three micromolar and uh, dramatically inhibited the cell viability of the resistant cells when treating with 10 micromolar bolinostat. And so, as I mentioned, there are no current uh, PEG-10 uh, inhibitors out there or any agents that target them. And so we scanned the literature and in, in our hands, we, we did a kind of a small compound screen to look for known compounds that may have effects on PEG-10. And we identified uh, the Menin MLL in inhibitor MI503 and the structure shown there on the left. And when we treated uh, our drug resistant cells with this, we observed a significant decrease in PEG-10 uh, by quantitative real-time PCR shown on the right. And so uh, MI503 and uh, similar comp compounds, uh, it's, it's analog uh, KO539 is currently in clinical trials, as well as SNDX5613. Uh, and these agents uh, block uh, the interaction of menin and MLL. And so, uh, MLL plays an important role in a specific uh, sub, subset of AML. And so there's currently a phase one, two trial of KO539 in relapsed refractory AML that's showing pr promising activity. Uh, so far in, in their trial, they did observe two uh, CRs. Uh, interestingly, one of them is one they expected to see where the CR was in a patient that expressed a uh, N NPM1 mutation. However, the other CR was in a patient that did not have a uh, NPM1 mutation or MLL rearranged disease. And so even though this drug is designed to be a target agent to inhibit ML M men and MLL interaction, uh, it's certainly quite possible given this clinical data that uh, this drug uh, may have additional effects. And, and we are very interested in this since then uh, it may suggest that uh, PEG-10 may be playing a role there as well. So then finally, uh, one of the last questions that just kind of rolled out of the lab here is can we then uh, sensitize uh, HUD-78 resistant cells with a combination of bolinostat and MI503? And indeed, we, we, we can. Again, these cells are very highly resistant to bolinostat. Uh, MI503 actually had a pretty modest response as a single agent, but combined together, we observed a, 
a very nice synergistic response with this drug combination. Now, I'd just like to wrap up talking about where we plan on going with this project next. Uh, so first is we'd like to define PEG-10 as a novel biomarker in uh, PTCL and CTCL. And so, as I mentioned earlier, these are pretty rare uh, tumor types and we do not see uh, a large volume of their, their, them at UA or, or anywhere for that matter. And so we, we started uh, collaborations with uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering and also MD Anderson. Uh, and hopefully between us and both of them, we can then uh, get enough uh, samples so we can test to see whether or not PEG-10 is indeed uh, significantly upregulated in the uh, HDAC inhibitor uh, refractory uh, population. We'd also like to further investigate the mechanisms of PEG-10 and how it's able to prom promote HDAC inhibitor resistance in our models. We would like to also evaluate uh, MI503 and other menin MLL inhibitors as uh, potentially a, a novel approach or at least a starting point uh, to investigate their ability to antagonize PEG10 expression and resensitize our resistant cells to bolinostat. We've engaged with uh, the Arizona Center for Drug Discovery. And so we've spoke with Selena uh, and we about uh, number one, uh, conducting additional small molecule drug screens to hopefully identify uh, additional agents that may be decreased PEG-10 levels. And finally, we, we have obviously identified MI503 as an agent that does decrease PEG-10, but uh, clearly it wasn't designed for that goal. And so we're currently working with WE to see whether or not we can possibly uh, uh, modify that compound and hopefully generate uh, some new compounds with uh, enhanced uh, ability to decrease PEG-10 levels. And I'll just wrap up here. I'd like to thank uh, the, pe the people in the lab, Sharful, Claudia, and Trace. Uh, of course, uh, Jennifer and Dan uh, on the lymphoma team, uh, Matt Coffey from Oncolytics, uh, we and Selena from ACDD, and of course, uh, the research support for this project that we've received over the years. All right, so thank you. Thank I can you now take any questions. Yeah. Uh, very interesting. Nice to see your progress on this topic. We have a, a couple of questions in the in the Q and A. Um, uh, two from uh, Subinir Tashado. Uh, both aiming towards mechanism, I think, which is sort of where my questions go as well. First is, is there any evidence that resistance to HDAC inhibitors can be abolished by inhibition of checkpoint kinases? And then I'll, I'll read his second question as well. Uh, you, you mentioned that inhibitory effects of HDAC inhibitors on stats target anti-apoptotic genes. However, overexpression and aberrant activation of stat signaling have been related to resistance to HDAC inhibitors. Can you talk about that? Second one's hard. Go for the first one first. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, so we don't really see anything with immune check, checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, they're not commonly used in T cell lymphoma. Uh, we think that in general, uh, the relapsed refractory T cell lymphoma patient, patients, if you will, are uh, immune cold if that makes sense. And so therefore we haven't seen good results with uh, nivolumab or pembrolizumab uh, in those models. However, though, real lysin does tend to stimulate um, a pretty potent uh, immune response. And so we've actually published a paper, I think it was a year ago, not in T, T cell lymphoma, but in MM, showing that if we prime cells with the real lysin and then follow that with a anti-PD-1 antibody, that we can then resensitize those cells to immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy. But I don't think that treating with immune checkpoints uh, would be uh, that successful uh, in the bolinostat refractory population. And I believe the second question was related to STAT1. Stat That's target anti-epiptotic genes, however, overexpression and aberrant 
uh, activation of STAT signaling has been related to resistance to HDOC inhibitors? Right. So I, I think STAT1 does play a, a bit of a complex role. And uh, I, it, it was shown in a prior, prior work by Victoria Rishon. I don't know if you know her. She was in, involved with Merck and the development of Saha or Varenostat. And uh, her, her results are actually a little bit contradictory to ours, where she thinks that like, um, uh, you know, stats tend to get upregulated in response uh, to varinostat. Uh, we actually don't see that in our hands. It might be a difference uh, of the models or also the difference of the drugs. Obviously, she's focused on varinostat and, and we're, uh, we're investigating valinostat. And so they're obviously similar drugs but uh, they're uh, different uh, chemically, so it's possible there's different things going on there. Okay, one last quick one here uh, before we move along um, from Ron Lynch, uh, who's wondering about how you measure uh, tumor volume in the real license studies. Sure, so those were uh, sub-Q models. So we do just measured the, them by simple caliper measurements. And so actually the T-cell lymphomas are a little bit of a challenge to actually grow, grow in the mice, but we have optimized the Carpus 299 model. It seems to, to grow pretty well, but uh, we haven't tried to do any um, orthotopic models with, uh, with uh, T cell lymphoma yet. Okay. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Stefan. Um, we'll move along to our next speaker, I think, in the interest of time. Um, we will uh, next uh, have 